in Old Nauvoo, when the saints were gathering there, literally by the boatload, Brother Joseph would often be there to greet the newcoming saints. And he would say to them some pretty audacious things. He would say to them things like, we're so glad that you are here. We were hoping that you would be coming soon. We've been waiting for you. He would look them right in the eye and say, we need someone with your abilities for this work. Such a familiar greeting from a relative stranger must have prov provoked various reactions. I'm sure many hearts were thrilled and some were comforted. I imagine that for some there was that panic that we feel when someone recognizes us but we don't recognize them in return. But still for others, I'm sure there must have been a few that may at first have seen disingenuous to receive that kind of a greeting. It may have come off a little like a sales pitch. But if there were any who were initially incredulous or suspicious of his sincerity, those shadows of doubt were soon dispersed by his example. He proved that he was the real thing through his devoted service and his consistent love. That love is one of the Prophet Joseph's many spiritual gifts. He was given this gift and cultivated this gift to be able to see others the way that God sees them, even his enemies. Well, I want to tell you here today that I have been praying about you over the past few weeks. I want to share with you an experience that I've had in that process as I've anticipated our time together. Now, I don't consider myself to be a visionary man. At uh, this point in my life, it seems not to have been my gift, but I have been praying about you. I've been asking Heavenly Father to show you unto me, or to be more precise, that I might see or perceive just a little of your world, your experience, your hearts, and your needs, so that I could know what to share with you that might do us both the most good. So although that you are relative strangers to me, I admit that I feel a little like Brother Joseph when I tell you that I am so glad that you decided to come here today. I wish that I could look into your eyes individually as he did to those saints so that you could know it is neither pretense nor platitude when I tell you I was hoping to see you here today. That we need someone with your abilities for this work. And because God answers prayers, I feel I have a message or two to deliver to you. Now in saying that, I want to make clear that I, uh, I don't pretend to receive revelation for you. I don't have that stewardship. It's not my accountability. That job will be left to you. I'm a sojourner like you. We are fellow pilgrims. And for today, at least, we share this path together. And it is an honor. At our house, we love the missionaries. We love to feed the missionaries and we love to have the missionaries over. We love to hear their stories and their lessons. And um, we're usually one of the first to know in our ward when a transfer happens because a new missionary will often accidentally track into our home and get a bit of a surprise. Sometimes when I meet a new elder or a sister, 
uh, for the first time, they're surprised to find out that I have what they often call a real job. I am indeed a counselor by profession. I work in a wilderness treatment center uh, for at-risk adolescents and young adults called Anasazi, the making of a walking. At Anasazi, we utilize um, the wilderness settings and primitive living skills to help families of these youth and uh, to address uh, behavioral, I'm not checking, my, I'm doing the time so I can know how much time I have to spend with you. I'm not um, checking my Facebook or anything, but I could I'll take a picture of you guys because you look awesome. <laughs> I'm passionate about the work that we do at Anasazi. Looking back on my journey into that field, uh, I can see that it wasn't by happenstance that I ended up there. I have a a journey of my own, which includes um, some mental health issues and some learning struggles. Uh, some of them meet diagnostic criteria and some don't. But for a lot of us in that field, uh, we go into it thinking that we can um, get some access to figuring ourselves out. It hasn't happened so far. I'll let you know if it does. From my youth and into my uh, early adulthood, these struggles for me went unrecognized and untreated. I know that some of you here today share in those struggles. For some of you, you're already aware and on the path of recovery, and some of you are not. I know that you suffer and no one else sees that you suffer. And part of my message for you today is that you don't need to suffer the way that you are, that there is light and there is help and there is hope for all of us. I know that in the depths of that struggle, the darkness can feel almost overwhelming and we may begin to fear that the light may never come. But as each day dawns, the rising sun repeats his teaching of a powerful and fundamental lesson that we must never forget, and that is that light chases away darkness. This simple truth is not a mere observation of natural phenomenon, but more like a law which is applicable to the physical and non-physical aspects of our world and our lives. Sometimes it can be easy to forget this truth, if we have not grown past feeling or driven too much to dull and distract our senses, then we may, may be fortunate enough to notice when we are walking in darkness. Having made that realization, sometimes we'll employ various strategies to get ourselves out of it. Sometimes, sometimes we may try to seek the source of that darkness as though it were a fountain. If we could plug up that fountain, then there would be no more darkness in our lives. Sometimes, noticing there's darkness in our lives, we'll tend to try to gather that darkness, to sweep it up with a broom or scoop it out with a shovel. We could collect it and contain it and get rid of it. And sometimes, if we notice that we're walking in darkness, we'll try to replace that darkness with something that's just a little bit less dark. None of these strategies can work because only light has that power to expel darkness. These strategies can turn out to be like uh, illusions. They can give us the counterfeit feeling of making progress because there's movement. But we must never forget movement with actual progress. They're not the same thing. There is a singular effective formula for ridding one's life of darkness, and that is by adding light. And not just once. We must seek light and add it to our lives continually. So in finding that one is walking in darkness, the wise observant pilgrim will immediately look for light. The fact that you are here today tells me that you know quite a bit about it already, that you know where to look for light. Prophets and apostles, both ancient and modern, including this past weekend at General Conference, have been teaching and reteaching us why we must look for light and how to do it. 
as a mental health practitioner. I know many Latter-day Saints who have operated under the tragic misunderstanding that we must simply uh, pray our blues away. And if that didn't work, they surmised that it must be due to a lack of faith or even more tragic, uh, a lack of worthiness, which only reinforced some of their most destructive beliefs and thoughts. This is one of the reasons that I find the imagery of light so helpful. When the sun rises, you may notice how freely nature seems to let go of the darkness and does not resist the light the way we sometimes do. In addition to looking for light in the usual primary answer type of ways, there may be some ways of looking for light that you may not have thought of. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the primary answers because obviously you already know them, but some of the other ways that you might not have thought of, I do want to, to share. Uh, with you. Some of these are um, developing a sense of wonder and awe and gratitude. President Uchtdorf has spoken extensively a number of times about that subject, about being grateful, uh, of cultivating that attitude of great gratefulness. One of the other uh, solutions or ways to look for light that you might not have thought of. And I think this is uh, maybe one of the most important, and that is our connection with each other, the community that we share. Whenever we're in darkness, it feels like we're alone. And God has placed us on this earth in the midst of others and given us strict instructions to be one. That's a powerful step that we can take when we find out that we're walking in darkness to reach out for help. And not only to reach out for help, but to reach out in service with the aim of connecting to someone else and being uh, useful, being helpful in their journey. Another um, Another way that we're taught sometimes to uh, seek for light and to look for light is taught by uh, Alma. In uh, the fifth chapter of Alma, he reviews a, a technique for looking for light that I think is pretty intriguing and has helped me to gather light um, in a way that's really changed my life which is why I want to share it with you today. In the fifth chapter of Alma, uh, starting in about verse 16, this is after, this is a very famous uh, chapter in Alma, this, this sermon that he delivers is full of beautiful doctrine. It's going to be very familiar to you is where he talks about having a mighty change of heart, where he talks about, have you received his image in your countenance? In verse 16, he begins by saying, I say unto you, can you imagine to yourselves that you hear the voice of the Lord? This phrase, can you imagine, is something that we use quite a lot in our day-to-day -day, um, conversations. But I suspect that Alma is using it somewhat differently here because he repeats it a number of times. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Alma is trying to get these people to engage that uh, faculty, that ability that God gave them to simulate an experience. This experience simulator, this imagination of ours, is a powerful tool to help us to understand gospel principles, especially to understand the scriptures and to gather light to understand those things in our heart. For understanding, after all, happens in the heart. This is a principle that um, is taught throughout scriptures. So I'd like to um, maybe do a little exercise with you today with that in mind. This idea of trying to imagine more deeply, more fully as you study the scriptures. 
and let's explore a New Testament story to illustrate what I mean. This will be in the 13th chapter of Matthew. Um, this is, he records a, a pretty well-known story here. Uh, this story finds the apostles all gathered together, following and listening to, to Jesus. And they're aboard a boat with the master as he's preaching to a, a group, a multitude that's over on the seashore. So as he's teaching them these things, and in chapter 13, he teaches them um, the parable of the sower. And this is the part where um, one of the apostles, after he's finished with the parable, he asks, why do you teach to them uh, in parables? Now I want to uh, make sure that I um, set this up properly to engage your imagination in the way that Alma talks about. So I want you to, before, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and read some of these verses uh, with you, and I'm going to invite you to ponder a few of these questions to, uh, again, to, with, with the aim of engaging that imagination uh, in a more uh, deep way that will hopefully link to some understanding that, that you haven't been um, aware of before. So I want you to close your eyes. You can leave off writing down notes for a minute. Uh, so I want you to, to close your eyes. You may catch another moment or two of sleep, but that won't be quite as useful to you uh, as if you stayed awake. Imagine in your mind's eye that you're one of these apostles. And I just want you to ponder some of these questions. Imagine in your mind's eye that you were one of the apostles. You're on the boat. Depending on which apostle you are, you may be very comfortable on a boat. You may be very, very uncomfortable. How does the Savior speak as he addresses you and the apostles versus the way he speaks to the multitude? How close are you sitting to him as he speaks? Are you sitting on the deck? Are you sitting on a pile of nets? Are you sitting on some kind of chair? How long have you been sitting there? What is that doing to your body? Who's sitting next to you? What's your conversation with that person been like that day? What time of day is it? What's the weather like? What are you wearing and how long have you been wearing it? When was the last time you had something to eat or to drink? What have you been doing that day? Who have you been thinking of? Have you been walking all day? Have you been fishing all day? Where does he look as the Savior teaches? At which moments does he look at you? Does he hold your gaze as if to teach you something in specific? Do others in the quorum notice this happening? In this teaching, Jesus quotes a well-known prophecy from Isaiah. If you are a Jew and chosen to be one of the twelve, are you familiar with this prophecy? What do you experience as the Savior speaks about this prophecy fulfilled? Now I'm going to go ahead with that in mind, just sort of pondering and putting you in that place. I'm going to read what Jesus says to the apostles in response to this question, why do you speak to them in, in parables? Starting in uh, verse 11, he answered, and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whoso hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore I speak unto them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their eyes are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts 
and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are ye. Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your hearts, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. I wish that we were in a Sunday school class so I could see what this experience was like for you. If this sort of deep imagining has had any impact on your understanding of this, this passage that hopefully has been familiar to you before today. I'm going to close with my testimony. Brothers and sisters, I know that Joseph Smith saw exactly what he said he saw. I know it. I likewise know that each one of us is going to live forever, whether we like it or not. I testify to you of the divine mission of the Savior Jesus Christ, that his mission is always to heal our hearts, to make us one with him and with his Father, that we can live with them again. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.